very simple things become, you, you realise the goodness of them. Of a square meal, of a glass of water on a really hot day, or two glasses of water. So you become really thankful for the things that really matter. Welcome to Not Just Theologians, Dominicans and their peculiar pursuits. In their 800 year history, Dominicans have shown a notable fascination for the curious and the bizarre. St. Catherine de Ricci liked to bake marzipan, St. Margaret of Hungary bred hedgehogs, and St. Albert the Great was enchanted by worms in the garden. The mind of a preacher requires a willingness to seek truth in all things, to see the hand of God at work in the whole of his creation. And so Dominican life has always encouraged a healthy eclecticism, a zeal for the peculiar, a living out of St. Paul's maxim to take every thought captive for Christ. Not Just Theologians is a new series in which we will explore some of the peculiar pursuits and passions of the friars to see where a mind in pursuit of truth might be led. Today we speak with Father Richard Finn, who teaches patristics and church history on his hiking adventures. Today we have the pleasure of talking to Father Richard Finn, who is a church historian and a patristics scholar. He has served as regent and novice master before his current roles as director of the Las Casas Institute and archivist of the province, in which position he is currently working on a history of the English Dominicans. Besides these varied interests, he also has a great love of the outdoors and goes for walks and long hikes very often. So, Father Richard, can you tell us what your schedule is, so to say? During the week, I try and get out for up to an hour each day if I can, if time allows. But then on the weekend, I like to have a walk of, say, three or four hours, you know, really get a good leg stretch. Um, but then, of course, at different times of the year, it's possible to do something much longer. So, for many years, Holy Week has meant the Student Cross Walking Pilgrimage which is great fun. And in the summer holidays, I would usually have the kind of holiday with friends that involves a fair bit of walking most days. And what kinds of places do you go to? What do you normally go to when you go um, the weekend or during the week for a short one? Oh, well, the great thing about living in Oxford is it's so easy to get out into the countryside from the city centre. You can go across Port Meadow, you can go through the University Parks, over the Water Meadows, beyond the Ring Road up to Charwell. You can follow the Thames down past Ifley. You can go up onto Boar's Hill, Foxcombe. There are so many possibilities. So, um, it sounds like this is a long-standing passion for you. How did it all begin? How did it become such an important part of your life? I think it started with my grandfather. When I was a boy of about six or seven, uh, he would take me for walks, often blackberrying at the right time of year. He was in his seventies, he had a walking stick, but that was really for hooking down the topmost branches of the bramble bush to get the biggest, juiciest blackberries. And he had a cracking pace. So that's where I learned to walk, if you like. Uh, my parents also belonged to the local rambling society. They took me out for walks. My mother knew all the wildflowers. She knew her Herb Robert, her Campion, her Purple Loose Dry, Devil's Bit, Sheep's Bit. And my father could identify all the butterflies, the birds. So it was a great education. So it was not only an interest in hiking, but also a love for the natural beauty of the countryside. Oh, absolutely. And um, you mentioned at the beginning the Student Cross Pilgrimage, in which you participate around Holy Week every year. What do they consist in and how many people attend them? Okay, so uh, for those who don't know it, Student Cross is a cross-carrying pilgrimage in Holy Week. The adult legs meet up on the Friday before Palm Sunday, start walking on the Saturday morning. Groups of, say, 20, 25 maybe maximum 30 pilgrims. Uh, and 
it's a wonderful expression of both prayer and friendship. My late novice master, Herbert McCabe, once described it as a crash course in Christian discipleship. Because you have to learn to get along with each other and you have to achieve a common purpose. You have to get to your destination safely, uh, celebrate the liturgy together, listen to each other, put up with the people who walk too slowly or too quickly. I'm usually one of the people who are said to walk too quickly. <laughs> um, and you enjoy the immense hospitality of parishioners and people along the way. People who take you in after a hard day's walking and let you have a shower, uh, prepare a meal for you, find a place on a church hall where you can kick down for the night. Although these days I tend to escape and try and find a spare bed in a presbytery. Mm -hmm. How many of these pilgrimages have you participated in? So I reckon I've done about 20 so far. Wow. Uh, starting in the, the, the mid-90s. Um, with the, first of all with the Midland leg. Then I was chaplain for six years to the London leg. Uh, which is a lovely route. It starts off um, in outer London around Epping. And goes through Royston and Cambridge and then out into the Fens. And then later on I switched back to become chaplain to Midland uh, for about 12 years. Um, that's a great route starting from Leicester, going through Leicestershire, Rutland, then out into the Fens again, then coming back up into the North Norfolk countryside. And of course all these legs meet together in Walsingham on Good Friday and celebrate the Great Easter liturgies together. And these days there are not just adult legs, there are also legs for young families, uh, and a teenage leg as well. Uh, I suppose as a chaplain you were in a privileged position to engage in deep or at least good, honest conversations with all kinds of people as you walk. It's not that they're always very deep. Sometimes they are. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of companionship, a lot of singing, a lot of laughter. Uh, it's, it's also very important that it's lay-led. So there are elections each year for the leader of the leg, for the secretaries of the leg, and for the person who's the general organising director of student cross, God for short. <laughs> and the chaplains are there at the invitation of the, the laity. And I think for many years it functioned really well as a school of leadership, so that people came along, they experienced it the first year, they were encouraged to stand as a secretary, come back the next year, and then maybe be a leader the year after that. And it's really important to help people discover their gifts in that way. So having taken part in these pilgrimages for such a long time, you must have very fond memories. Is there anything in particular that has stayed with you? Well, sometimes it can be something very moving. Often during the day we'll stop uh, to rest, but also for what we call a station, where somebody gives a reflection on what's happening in their lives and where God is in their life. And that can be very moving when people open up in that way, when they trust the group uh, with that experience, that insight. Sometimes it's much more mundane. Uh, I remember being caught in the most terrible hailstorm and rainstorm, and we were utterly utterly soaked to the skin, but it makes for a great esprit de corps, uh, and never has a pub door seemed so welcoming. <laughs> Those are the things that you remember more fondly later on, I suppose. Um, and how about the time between your childhood and joining the Dominicans? Did you do much walking there in secondary school or at university, for example? When we were at school, uh, secondary school, I was part of a group that was taken to the Brecon Beacons, uh, sort of mid Wales. And that was wonderfully bleak and empty. We stayed in the youth hospital for a few nights. And that was a great eye opener. And then, when I was a little bit older, but still at secondary school, a group of friends, we started to do the long distance footpaths. 
the simpler ones, the North Downs Way, the South Downs Way, the Ridge Way. That was great fun. That gave me, I feel like, an appetite for these things once I joined the Order. And in the Order, I was very lucky. In my novitiate, I was able to walk from Dublin to Belfast with a group of people for Amnesty International. And again, to experience the hospitality of people on the way. It's very humbling, very edifying when people welcome you into their homes. Another famous walk you have participated in is the Coast to Coast Walk. Can you tell us about it, what it consists in? So the Coast to Coast Walk was devised by a very famous man called Wayne Rapp, a famous fell walker who, who wrote a, a number of guidebooks to walks in the Lake District. And he devised this route from the West Coast to the East Coast. So you start, usually going you know, west to east, you start at St. Bee's Head and you go through various central parts of the Lake District. There's Emmerdale, Blacksail Pass, Rostwake Grassmere, Horswater, over to Shap, and then into the North York Dales. You've got Richmond, you've got the Vale of York, Osmotherly, onto the Cleveland Moors, and then round to Whitby and Robin Hood's Bay at the end. Stunning scenery. And um, am I correct to understand that as a novice master at some point you took your novices to do it? Well, I took my ex-novices okay. to do it with the help of um, Father Benedict Yuna. So it was uh, Benedict, Brother Sam, uh, uh, to so Sam Burke, Toby Lees and myself, four of us, walking in our habits to raise money for our training fund with a support crew for the heavy luggage. Uh, and great hospitality along the way. We prayed for our benefactors each day. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Had, had some amusing moments. I mean, at one point, because we were walking in the habit, we, a group of refuse collectors with their bin lorry uh, mistook us for a, a stag party in fancy dress. <laughs> 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 They were pleasantly surprised to discover we were real fried. <laughs> we're actually the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> How um, would you say that walking has informed your life as a Dominican friar in a more specific way? Yes. And I think the main thing I'd want to say is walking is great. As, as part and parcel of friendship, uh, some of my oldest, closest friends have been student cross pilgrims or people that I've shared walking holidays with. Mm. There's something very companionable about a walk. Mm. So it's uh, similar in a way to the degree and quality of sharing that one experiences in a Dominican community. Oh yes. Yeah. And of course on student cross there are three people carrying the cross at any one time. And as you take your turn it kind of reshuffles the pack so you were talking to one person before you picked up the cross. Then you're talking maybe to somebody else at the front. And then you go to the very back of the pilgrimage. And there's another side of grouping emerges. Is there a spirituality of walking? I think there are several spiritualities of walking. Because there are, it depends partly on how fast you're walking, the speed. It depends partly on what you know about the landscape you're walking through and partly on whether you're walking with somebody else or with other people or whether you're walking on your own. So take the speed at which you're walking. Generally speaking, the slower you walk, the more you see. It might be first thing in the morning. The way in which dew, the, the little droplets on a spider's web, or seeing the, the low loops made by uh, a green woodpecker as it goes from one field to the next. Or hearing the, the keening, the high cry of a buzzard way, way up above you. And if you go too fast, you just miss those things. On the other hand, there can be a real physical pleasure in walking quickly. So
say walking quickly uphill, filling your lungs with air, feeling your heart pump, striding out. So there's that dimension to a good walk. Then take the history of the landscape that you walk through. It could be old churches, houses, but not just that. It could be street names. There's a Methodist chapel that um, the Midland Legs stay in, uh, which is in Reform Street. The name says something. Mm -hmm. It could be the woodland that you're walking through. Is usually, it's usually a managed um, woodland. So it might have been pollarded or coppiced. In West Cornwall, some of the field patterns date back right to the Bronze Age. So there's all that history that connects you with other people. People maybe who planted those amazing mature trees that now you can enjoy and, and, and take shade underneath. Also people who enclosed the commons, who privatised the land you're walking through. And then you remember how good it is in this country that there are legal footpaths. Uh, there's a right to walk. Um, and then again, if you're with other people, there's the art or the spirituality of listening. And there's a, a companionable silence as well when you're walking together. Um, so there are all these different spiritualities, but a, there's always an opportunity when you're walking to thank God for the gifts, whether it's the beauty of what you're looking at or the, the friendship of the people you're walking with and so on. What are the two or three must-do walks in Oxfordshire or elsewhere that you would recommend to people listening? Oh, ah, well that depends on who they are and what they enjoy. Because there's a great freedom in these things, isn't there? You don't want to prescribe things for people. I had great fun 11 years ago with a friend called Cathy. We did the, um, the Yorkshire Three Peak Challenge. It's a circular walk and you do that you climb Penigent and Wernside and Ingleborough and you have to get around the circuit in less than 12 hours. It's very hard going, but it's great fun. Now whether, whether I have the health to do that now, I don't know. Uh, I would love to if I, if I could. Um, but for other people it, it might just be uh, there's something very enjoyable about the Southwest Coast Park where you've got this, the sea on one side, um, uh, this deep blue, fantastic. Or the history that's there on the coast path. The, the, um, the engine houses from the Cornish tin mines, for example. What would you say is the most challenging walk you've ever faced? Mm. That might, it might have been the Yorkshire Three Peaks Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, it could be a simpler walk, but just has a very challenging section. So there's a, a, a section of a ridge in, in the Lake District called Striding Edge. Uh, I think that's what it's called. But it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite... The path is quite narrow. Um, when I was a teenager, I had um, quite quite bad vertigo, so I'm I'm a little bit challenged sometimes by narrow paths and great drops. <laughs> well, I would be as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, how would you say the current lockdown has affected uh, your passion for walking and, and your usual outings? Okay. Well, I mean, I had bad health starting in. September 2018 when I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia and then had a bone marrow transplant last March of March of last year. So lockdown initially was about shielding uh, and then later I caught COVID-19 so that meant quarantine and then walking was just about either walking around the garden 
or walking up and down the corridor. And that was good, but it was pretty restricted. You've experienced all the modalities of walking. <laughs> yeah. So it was a huge joy when I could get out again into the countryside. So that was just wonderful. And you could say that's a work in progress to recover my stamina. What was the first walk that you did after you were able to go out again? Oh, I'm not sure I can remember. Oh, I, uh, I think um, well, one, one early one was just Father Robert took me for a walk uh, around parts of Northern Gardens and mm -hmm. uh, North Oxford. There were plenty of wide roads and pavements and not too many people. Because it was quite nerve-wracking to be mm. out again. And like for so many people, I suppose, during the current lockdown, when you go out after staying in quarantine for some time, you notice things around you that you hadn't seen before. Um, I don't know, you look at a tree that you had never actually realised was there, uh, that kind of thing. Did you have a similar impression when you started going out again? Oh yeah, well also just to see how the seasons had moved on, you know. Um, to, to see the changes in the flowers that were open or the... Um, the, the, the state of the trees and of course then to follow uh, how the countryside has moved in the last month or so from being this re really vibrant green to this sort of yellowing green <laughs> um, Are there any particular walks that you would like to do in the future? Oh yeah uh, If I get my strength back sufficiently I would love to do the Camino I've not yet done that um, the challenge really is, is, is to find the time and, and, and the money to, to be able to do it. Um, but also, I would really like, if possible next year, to repeat something of the walk that the first friars did, the first Dominicans did when they came to England in 1221, because it's going to be our 800th anniversary. And I would love to walk, say, from Ramsgate on the coast, Canterbury, go from Canterbury to London, and then on from London to Oxford, arriving in the city, as they did on August the 15th, the Feast of Our Lady. Whether I can do that, I don't know. I hope some friars are able to do that. It'll partly depend on how the pandemic moves over the next six months or so. Now, if there's someone listening who's not very keen on walking, how would you try to persuade them to give it a try? What would be your recommendation? I don't think it's my place to uh, <laughs> uh, cheer the others into doing what they don't want to do. Um, but I would, I would say, if people want to get out, walking is a wonderful way of discovering more about their surroundings more about the history of this country, for example. Um, there's a real freedom. Mm. 